Welcome everybody to today's webinar hosted by the International Solar Energy Society ISIS and organized by the IEA HSE Solar Academy. We are very pleased to have all of you here and we are especially happy to welcome back the IEA HSC Solar Academy for this third webinar in 2020. Today's webinar will highlight the key data and findings of two of, two of the most recent SHG market reports, Solar Heat Worldwide by the IEA HSC Solar Heating and Cooling Program and Renewables 2020, the Global Status Report from REN21. In addition, the webinar will have a special focus on a special kind of solar system in Greece. My name is Arabella and I am the Communications and Outreach Officer here at the ISIS HQ in Freiburg, Germany, and I will give you a short introduction into ISIS and the work we do, as we have many new participants joining us on this webinar today. The International Solar Energy Society, ISIS, is a non-profit UN accredited membership NGO. Our vision is 100% renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. ISIS represents a diverse membership of academics, researchers, energy practitioners, consultants, students, businesses, and advocates. ISIS works together with like-minded organizations from countries all around the world to advance the renewable energy transformation. There are many benefits to joining ISIS and you can find out more on our homepage. Some of the benefits are the exclusive access to presentations and webinar recordings such as today's in the ISIS webinar archive. ISIS members can also get discounts and even free registrations to ISIS events and partner events. Every month, ISIS publishes a newsletter for our members where you can follow our progress and share your news. Members can also subscribe to our academic journal Solar Energy, our flagship publication, at a reduced price. And in the ISIS online bookshop, ISIS members qualify for reduced prices on the different publications. So we welcome those who are not yet members to join today to support our work. For those who are already a member, we thank you for your support. As a special benefit to all attendees of today's webinar, we are very happy to offer a very special discount when signing up as an ISIS member. All attendees of this webinar will receive a 20% discount code as a follow-up to this webinar over the next few days. This special offer is only valid for the upcoming next two weeks, so sign up quickly and join ISIS and the global solar community. Now, for some brief information on the webinar and especially the Q&A section before we start. During today's webinar, our expert speakers will give their presentations and this will be followed by the Q&A section for you, the audience. For the Q&A section, we invite you to send in your questions and we are looking forward to your participation. When sending in the questions, please write who the question is for and keep your questions short and precise. Please feel free to start sending in your questions anytime throughout the webinar. I'm now happy to introduce you to our moderator for today, sorry for that, which is Pedro Diaz. Pedro will introduce you to our speakers and guide us through the Q&A session. Pedro is the Secretary General of Solar Heat Europe and he holds a management degree from the Instituto Politicino de Viana de Castello in Portugal and he has an extensive experience in both private sectors and non-governmental sector. Previously, Pedro worked in the heating sector and more specifically in gas retail and commercialization of heating equipment. Pedro, I'm very happy to hand over the floor to you. Here you go. Thank you very much for the introduction, Aravella, uh, and to, to ISIS and uh, IASHC for the opportunity to cooperate uh, once again with this webinar as moderator. So, uh, as, as mentioned, my name is Pedro Diaz and I represent Solid Europe. Uh, you might know it uh, as uh, his previous name, ESTIF, uh, European Solar Ministry Federation. Um, so we are a trade association present, representing the solar heating and cooling sector in Europe. So I'm quite happy about uh, the topic today. Uh, I think we have quite uh, uh, important and insightful uh, presentations and uh, three uh, outstanding speakers uh, with us. So Werner Weiss, Berbel Epp and uh, Vasily Kidrosu. Um, we already went through the, the more technical details of the, of the webinar today. So we have one hour um roughly for the the presentations and then 30 minutes for a q a uh, session um so you know how you can uh, put forward your your questions already and uh, um without further ado i'd like to introduce our first speaker that will start with an introduction about the IASHC and its uh, solar academy and then uh, proceed for his presentation about the new edition of the solid worldwide so Werner Weiss, um, I am privileged to know Werner Weiss already for uh, uh, over a decade. So Werner is one of the most reputed experts in our sector. 
Um, we have worked uh, in, in different uh, contexts uh, within the solarity industry in the framework of the European Technology Innovation Platform on Renewability and Cooling, uh, of which Werner is also uh, a board member, a uh, very active member also of the Solar Thermal Technology Panel. Uh, but further than that, uh, Werner is a founding member and director of uh, AE Intech, um, a worldwide reputed uh, institute, research institute, um, and he's been always very engaged in national and international uh, uh, so thermal initiatives and, and projects and been giving an outstanding contribution to, to our sector. So Werner is a co-author of the study, uh, um, so he taught wide and he will present us the, the main findings of this new version uh, of the report after the brief presentation about IASHC. So Werner, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Um, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to present you, as was announced already, present you a very brief overview of the AA Solar Heating and Cooling Program, especially uh, the Solar Academy activities. Uh, the IA Solar Heating and Cooling Program um, was established already in 1977, so it was one of the first IA technology collaboration programs. Um, to date, we have 20 member countries, the European Commission, and seven international organizations. Uh, about 250 plus experts from different universities and research centers are working in the eight running tasks or projects on the different topics, like you can see here in district heating, PVT, solar neighborhood, lighting, but also industrial solar heat, um, going up to uh, renovating historic buildings and, of course, one of the most recent tasks, solar cooling for the Sunbelt regions. So it's a very broad variety of projects, what we usually call tasks. Uh, the Solar Academy, uh, we established some years ago, and the idea was to transfer the knowledge we gained in the different tasks uh, via webinars, via videos, or on site trainings. One of the webinars is going to happen today, and the next one I want to announce already is going to happen on the 24th of September. And uh, the topic is integrated solutions for daylight and electric lighting. So maybe you save the date already now. Uh, we have also available videos on our IASHC YouTube channel. So visit our website and, uh, and the YouTube channel. You can go for videos. Uh, with solar experts and of course all past solar academy webinars if you missed it and last but not least we offer on-site training uh, in the countries who are interested in the results of the IEA solar heating and cooling program this is available on request by the solar heating and cooling members we had already some past on-site trainings uh, in China two times in South Africa and two times already in the UK and if you're interested in this, uh, get in contact with the solar heating and cooling program. And where you find the contacts, you can see it here on our website. We are also available on social media, as I mentioned already on the YouTube channel. And uh, if you want to ask questions, you can always get in contact with the secretariat. You can see the uh, contact on this slide. So with this introduction, I want to jump to the to my main presentation of today, which is the Solar Heat Worldwide uh, Report. We are working on the Solar Heat Worldwide Report, or we are publishing it for the IA Solar Heating and Cooling Program already for 15 years. Um, and as you can see here, besides me, the my co-author is Monica Sperk Dürr. We're working for several years already together to prepare this annual report. Um, what it shows, the Solar Heat Worldwide Report gives then the current edition, gives the global market development and trends in 2019. So this shows really the general market development we had in the last year. And if you're interested in, in very detailed figures or data, 
we have it available for the year 2018. And it includes detailed data from 68 countries included in this report. This represents about close to 5 billion people or about 66% of the world's population. So our estimate is that we cover, we have detailed information of about 95% of the solar thermal market worldwide. Um, the first results, the status of solar thermal capacity in operation uh, and the energy, annual energy yields you see on, on this slide. Um, the accumulated thermal capacity in operation was close to 500 gigawatt uh, thermal, which is related to 684 million square meters of collector. This corresponds to about 389 terawatt hours of energy output of these systems. And you, as you can see here, the curve is really flattening. So this is uh, the result of 2000. Uh, 19, so we had unfortunately a market uh, decline of about 6% in 2019 compared to 2018. Uh, this was mainly due to shrinking market volumes like in China, the biggest market worldwide, but also uh, Germany and other major countries had a weak year in 2019. So this is the status uh, at the moment. On the other hand, we had uh, countries with growth rates of about 170% growth rate uh, in Denmark or also other countries like Greece, Brazil, India. I'm coming to this a little bit later on. We can see here, uh, these are the top 10 countries of the accumulated water collectors installed in 2018 now. Um, this um, China remained uh, like in the previous years, of course, uh, Concerning the total capacity, it remained the leader, followed by the US, Turkey, Germany, Brazil, India, Australia, Austria, Israel, and Italy. You can say, see in the different colors the different collector types used. Uh, just for China, I have to mention it shows just the evacuated tube collectors. They have also flat plate collectors, but they are somewhere in the third floor here. So we have to cut it here to, to bring it to make the other countries visible. Uh, what might be interesting developments, Italy has replaced Greece in the top 10 countries. So Greece, unfortunately, fell out of the top 10. Turkey moved past Germany in third position, and India took over, uh, took over Australia for number six position. And this gives a, a certain trend, which we have already for several years. If you go 10 years, back then it, the first top 10 were really dominated by the OECD countries. And now we see a clear trend uh, on the, in the top 10 shifting from historically dominated OECD countries to non-OECD countries. Why I'm mentioning OECD? Because the IEA is an uh, OECD organization. Here it gives you a slightly different picture. The top 10 countries of the accumulated water collectors installations per 1,000 inhabitants. So this gives you more an impression of the market penetration. Um, and then this gives you really a different picture. Uh, here, number one is Barbados, Cyprus, Austria, Israel, Greece, and so forth. And China is number eight in terms of installed capacity by inhabitants. So this is also giving a good impression, as I mentioned, on the market penetration. Concerning the distribution of newly installed capacity by collector type in 2018 worldwide, worldwide due to the dominance of China of the worldwide market, evacuated tube collectors are dominating the world market with 71%, followed by flat plate collectors about a a uh, quarter of the installed collector area, and then just 4.4% of the unglazed water collectors, which are usually swimming pool absorbers and a small percentage of air collectors. Um, what might be interesting in, in this regard, uh, we have also for several years, we had um, a, shift, a shift from evacuated tube collectors towards flat plate collectors. Um, 
we had in 2011, we had 82% of the total installed capacity was evacuated tube collectors. This is reduced to 71% now. And on the opposite, in the same time, flat plate collectors increased the share from 14% to 24%. So this is a clearly a trend you can see uh, nearly everywhere worldwide. Um, so reducing the, the share of evacuated tube, even if it's still the dominating collector. If you go to the distribution by type of system in the total installed uh, collector area in operation, then you can see the different uh, regions of the world. And on the one hand, the blue bars show you the thermosiphon systems and the yellow ones, the pump systems. And what it clearly shows in terms of total installed, so systems in operation, it's still nearly 60% of the total installed systems in an operation are uh, thermosiphon systems. Uh, this brings me also to the to, to mention that small scale thermal, thermal systems, especially if they are pumped systems, they are really coming uh, more and more under pressure by PV systems or heat pumps. So in the especially in Europe. Um, but on the other hand, uh, where we have thermosiphon systems, uh, we have we still see good market penetration. Even in China, where traditionally the most thermosiphon systems were installed, they had a decline of this market for several years. In 2019, however, uh, this uh, made a comeback with a, about 8.5 million square meters installed, mainly in rural areas in uh, China. Notable success has been achieved especially in those countries who have linked state social housing programs with the installation of solar water heating systems. Also Greece and some MENA countries are very successful in installation of thermosiphon systems. And if we have a look uh, at the growth rates of the most successful countries in 2019, then you can see besides Denmark, which is dominated by district heating, solar district heating, all other countries, Cyprus, South Africa, Greece, Tunisia, Brazil, India, who had growth rates in 2019, had dominate uh, markets with dominate, which are dominated by thermosiphon system. This is really interesting to see. And therefore we have in, in the, this year's edition of the uh, report with a special focus on solar thermal heating systems uh, done by thermosiphon systems. There's a long resist tradition already in Brazil. They started to combine uh, these thermosiphon systems with housing, solar domestic, so social housing programs already in the mid 90s. In, in the year 2000, they published a law that required electricity distribution utilities to invest 0.5% of their revenue um, in electricity conservation programs. And this ended up in a quite successful program, which is called My House, My Life, which was created in 2009. And then within this program, they installed 380,000 solar water heaters uh, in combination with the solar, uh, with the social housing program. And in 2019, they had a 6% growth rate again in Brazil. Something similar can be seen in a country which is usually not in our focus, like in Namibia, a Southern African uh, country where they want to install 185,000 new residential buildings. And all of these systems should be equipped with solar water heating systems. And you can see here, uh, 10,000 apartment uh, buildings are under construction at the moment in Osona village, which is about 60, uh, 60 kilometers north of the capital city of Windhoek. Similar developments we have in South Africa. They introduced in 2010 already a 1 million solar water heater program. It did not go as fast as they wanted, but nevertheless, 400,000 of these 1 million solar water heaters were installed already by the end of 2019. Coming now to the large scale solar thermal heating systems. Uh, this is an area with consistent growth in a number of countries, but as you most of you know, I guess dominated for a long time by the Danish market. You can see here the development 
started in the already early 80s on the left hand side of this chart and you can see the annual the number of the annual installations in Europe these are the orange bars and then the number of systems outside Europe these are the red parts of these bars and you can see um, a game changer if you want in uh, 2017 until 2015 it was clearly just dominated by European systems and starting with 2017 and especially you can see it in 2019 it was really dominated by systems outside Europe mainly coming from China and uh, the background of the dark blue uh, shows you the collector area in operation in Europe and the accumulated collector area in operation outside Europe is in this Turkish uh, color shown here. The total uh, collector area in these large scale systems is about 2.3 million square meters or 1,612 megawatt thermal. If you go to the little bit more closer to the number of systems and the collector area installed then you can see it's dominated by Denmark as mentioned already they have about 123 of these large scale systems in operation followed by China in the meantime with 64 systems Germany with 40 then we have other European countries with 12 and Austria with 30 systems in operation in 2019 10 new solar district heating systems with a call has been uh, have been added and this uh, are between 2300 square meters is the smallest system which has been added to 25000 square meters uh, which was an extension of Serbi uh, which was built in Denmark what i think is interesting is besides these traditional countries we had a big system installation uh, also in latvia in 2019 one system with 21,000 square meters in combination with the 8,000 cubic meter storage tank. And as I mentioned already before, China is really catching up very quick with systems, with these large scale systems. Uh, here is one, the 35,000 square meter installation uh, in Tibet. What I think is nice on this picture is you can see the big collector area in relation to the city here. Uh, and then I want to mention also a big system which was already installed in 2020 or put into operation. This is at the moment Germany's largest district heating system in Ludwigsburg with a cap capacity of 10 megawatt. Also an impressive new installation. Then I want to jump to another success story, which is solar heat for industrial processes. I have just one slide here. Um, we have about 800 ship systems, with about 1 million square meter in operation, ranging from small systems uh, to the 100 megawatt sector. What I should mention here, uh, we take now in our detailed analysis just systems in the ship uh, sector, if they're bigger than 50 square meters, all others which might exist or exist for sure, we don't take in our detailed analysis anymore. Therefore, we have for 300 of these systems, we have detailed information available. If you want to go in detail here, just follow this link on the shipplants.info, then you find for these 300 systems more detailed information. And the world's largest, largest process heat application is what you see here on this picture. It's Mira in Oman. There's currently 300 megawatt and another 60 megawatt were put in uh, operation recently. So this is the largest system, system used for uh, advanced oil recovery in an oil field. Uh, Babel app will give you some more detailed information on solar process heat. Here's just uh, the installed capacity where, where they are used. You can see it in the combined food and beverage industry. It's about 46% of the installed systems. However, they tend to be small or medium in size and only represent 9% of the installed capacity. 
Another promising sector is the textile industry, where we have 25 installations. Again, 20%, uh, 6%, sorry, of the installed thermal capacity. And the mining industry, which includes the two largest systems, that's the one in Oman, another one uh, in Chile, is the dominant sector in terms of installed capacity. These 13 systems we have here account for 75% of the total installed capacity. A new field we had a special focus this year are uh, solar thermal systems for the flower and vegetable cultivation. Uh, on this table, you can see the systems we have documented between 2013 and 2020, and it shows a significant number of systems ranging also from the size from small scale 126 square meters to 9,000 square meters. I think these systems were really not in the focus in the last years. So it might be really an interesting new application. It's just a picture of one of these systems in the Netherlands, the 6.5 megawatt uh, installed capacity. Shortly on PVD, it's a new market, photovoltaic thermal systems. As you might all know, these are collectors which combine the production of both types of solar energy, so solar heat and solar electricity simultaneously in one collector. Uh, we have it the second time in our uh, report. And in 2019, the total installed PVT collector area was 1.1 million square meters related to 606 megawatt thermal and 208 megawatt peak electricity. And the vast majority of collector was installed in Europe out of this 1.1 million, about 670,000 are installed in Europe. Then you can see the global market development from 2070 to 2019. Uh, what you can see here, we have a uh, grow, constant growth of about uh, 9% on average annually. On the worldwide scale in Europe, it's slightly higher. The growth rate in Europe was on, for PVT uh, of 14%. Where are the systems applied? Uh, it's about 86% are for solar air, preheating and cooling in buildings, followed by about 7% of domestic hot water preparation in single family houses, and about 4% for solar combi system that supply both domestic hot water and space heating, and about 1% of the installed capacity uh, provided heat and electricity to large domestic hot water systems for multiple family houses, hotels, hospitals, schools, etc. That's what you can see here in square meters and the number of installation on these slides. Coming to my last two slides, the environmental effects and contribution to the climate goals, which is also important, I think, for our technology. So the solar thermal yields at the end of uh, 2019 uh, or 18 uh, amounted uh, 392 terawatt hours. This relates to avoided CO2 uh, emissions of 133.6 tons. And this is usually, for most of us, we have no idea is it a lot or is it not. I, we tried this time to bring it into a relation to a country. This 133 million tons of CO2 is about 3.5 times the total CO2 emissions of Switzerland. So hopefully this brings you brings uh, the contribution uh, of solar thermal into a relation uh, to to a country. So if you are interested in more details, enjoy reading the overall report. It's a quite uh, comprehensive report with a total of uh, nearly 90 pages. Yeah, you can go more in detail and of course you can download the overall report from the link you can see here on, on the on the bottom. With this, I hope I could bring some interesting news on the solar thermal development to you and uh, I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Werner, for uh, indeed a very interesting presentation. So you told us about uh, the market development, uh, about an increased trend uh, 
uh, for flat plate collectors, while uh, evacuated collectors are still predominant. Um, you pointed out uh, also the relevance of the thermosiphon uh, systems, uh, and being also the ones with the best market penetration, and ones that resist better to the competition of other technologies. Uh, and you also provided an overview of the evolution in different uh, segments from uh, uh, the particular collectors uh, like PVT, thermosiphon systems to large scale, district heating and, and uh, ship, um, with examples of, of interesting programs at national level and uh, uh, some uh, best practice uh, examples. So indeed, quite comprehensive and quite interesting. And, uh, and I think a uh, good motivation for everyone present to read or, or uh, reread the, the reports uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the Solihit Worldwide reports. So we move now to the next uh, speaker, uh, Berbel Hepp. Uh, uh, Berbel is a, an extremely well-known journalist uh, covering for over 20 years the solar thermal sector. She is the founder and managing director of the agency uh, Solhico, and uh, uh, she is also the news editor of solarthermal.org. Besides being an author and a collaborator in many uh, relevant publications, uh, for instance, uh, the section on solar and cooling um, in the RAIN 21 Global Status Report, of which you will also talk uh, uh, today. So I'm very happy that in Solid Europe we've been uh, cooperating uh, for some time and uh, even more uh, in recent times with, with Berbel, um, because our knowledge of the, of the sector is, is without parallel, uh, as, as many of you uh, surely know, and, uh, and she holds for sure the best phone book in, in the sector, filled with sources from, from all over the world. So I am looking forward to hear this new presentation from Berbel on solid and cooling industry and business trends for 2019. So Berbel. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, uh, I will have a, a closer look to industry trends 2019. Sorico is, as it was mentioned, um, a network of solar thermal experts around the world and we source our knowledge mostly from thousands of news that we have written for solarthermalworld.org over the last uh, 11 years. Today I will give you an insight on what we researched uh, when we uh, drafted the chapter, the solar heating and cooling chapter of the Global Status Report. Uh, this is a very highly respected annual policy advocacy report, um, including all renewable energy and renewable energies. It's heavy 370 pages, including 103 pages for endnotes. The authors this year really um, heavily uh, used their press releases, which is usually translated in seven languages, to, to stress some alarming messages, to emphasize some alarming messages. The total final energy demand is still rising. The share of renewables is going down, is going up very slow. And then they, they uh, stated that the heating, cooling and transport sector, the barriers are nearly the same as 10 years ago. So they see a very stagnation on the policy side here. By the end of 2019, only 49 countries had renewable heating and cooling targets in place, whereas compared to 166 countries with renewable power targets. So all this is a very unbalanced situation looking at the, on the other side at the fossil fuel subsidies, which are still estimated to be at 400 billion US dollars in 2018, looking into a very small number of uh, countries, 23, which have solar heating and cooling policies in terms of building codes in place. So what is the good news? Their message is usually heard very well. So um, they have uh, the it's launched last week, and they were already quoted in 240 articles. The press release about the GSR, 1,000 plus uh, mentions in social media, and it will be downloaded over the year around 50,000 times. You can find all relevant information, including all the charts and the summary um, under this link here below. So the most important, uh, the most, uh, well, one of the uh, 
items we always do to, to prepare the GSR is uh, a ranking on the largest flat plate collector manufacturers. And now I interlink very well with what uh, Werner said already about the flat plate collectors, because uh, there is a huge trend in China towards flat plate collectors and they are increasing volumes. So we ended um, with uh, a 9% plus of these 20 largest companies in 2019 in terms of produced collector area, uh, which is astonishing if you remember that Werner Weiss told us that the world market was minus 6%. So we see a huge uh, construct, uh, concentration here in terms of uh, manufacturing capacity and we are losing small players also by insolvencies and so on. Uh, the, the composition of the ranking was more or less the same. It stayed fairly stable with big players from Turkey, Greece, Spain and so on participating. We had this year Solar Heart from Australia and Violent from Germany deciding not to take part and we have lost BDR Thamir and Ariston because they were too small and dropped from the listing. This has to do with a very difficult um, situation that Werner also mentioned in Central Europe. The Central European manufacturers lost 8% of their collector produce production volumes in 2019. We have still declining markets um, which caused this uh, reduction. In terms of winners and losers, Arkun Sanmark was a great winner in 2019, jumping up some places because they sold uh, solar district heating very nicely, 10 in Denmark, 3 outside Denmark. Hevalix from Poland, also a company which is concentrating on larger volumes for municipality projects, dropped in the listing because of an ending of a, uh, you know, subsidy program in Poland. When we uh, did the ranking this year, this ranking, I'm talking about these 20 largest flat plate collector manufacturers, we asked them for the largest uh, projects they installed in 2019. This was done for the first time. And this actually changed the chart uh, that you have already seen with Werner Weiss. It's a cooperation between iInTech and Sorico to publish this. And iInTech is, is uh, keeping all the long track records of projects and always cleaning them up, which is an excellent work. 2019 now is absolutely dominated by China because uh, what we found there is that we have a, a really large number of hot water centralized systems that we probably a bit ignored in the past years because we were not aware of them. And uh, we have so identified 56 projects outside Europe 2019 and 18 uh, new large systems inside Europe. Um, what is interesting, the outside Europe ones are mostly only hot water system, whereas the inside Europe ones are space heating included, that means district heating. This trend in China is really fascinating with these uh, large systems. Linua Paradigma, which was one of their major trans, uh, brands there, reported us even 27 projects that had more than 5,000 square meters. And this is central hot water systems for blocks of flats, hospitals, schools, and so on. Also Turkey, uh, because of our new survey, the started um, you know, reporting systems and uh, it came out that they have done 50 large scale prison systems in the last three years, which is, was all subsidized by the government. And these systems have about uh, 500 to several thousand square meters. Well, the pressure in Europe, which was already mentioned by um, Werner Weiss, can be also seen in this chart. This is probably the major part of the solar heating and cooling chapter of the GSR because it inclu includes the well, the additions of the 20 largest markets worldwide. Werner in his presentation picked the success stories and I, well, this is, there's a mix of both. You know, we have highly growing markets, but we have also unfortunately still highly uh, declining markets. Um, the picture as a whole uh, means that outside China, which had again a big decline in, in 2019, um, is stagnant. So the, the 
growth in some markets and the decline in other markets balance out. Um, we had even a small increase in 2018. So um, we see that um, all in all, it's, it's a fairly stable situation. We are not in a too bad decline still. Europe, um, thanks to Solar Heat Europe, we have estimated also the sort of preliminary figures for Europe, which means a minus uh, 1.8%, which is actually um, sort of bad news against the plus 8% from last year, but it's um, still around the zero. So, um, well, I think the decline in sales, uh, to be a bit more precise in uh, Europe, um, is attributed to the low rate of refurbishment in old buildings. I think we still have a low interest in solar heating systems among installers. So we have a really supply chain problem to the end user. We have still relatively high cost in residential solar thermal systems and high competition against heat pumps. So these four reasons are probably the ones which uh, struggle us most. And the countries which have a strong decline now still since three years are Germany, Italy, Austria, and Switzerland. Greece will be an extra story. They do very well in exports and in the national markets, and I'm happy that we have a detailed presentation on this later on. Uh, the absolute figures, uh, to make clear, they are all mentioned in, in the GSR in a table on page 239, so you can go back to that. Um, looking at to this chart, I want to give you a very sad news and want to uh, contribute to Les um, Nelson in the USA, who passed away in May. It was a very sad uh, story, very sudden in the middle of his professional life, and he contributed to our surveys and uh, international reports uh, for more than two decades. He is a very important voice or was a very important voice of the solar thermal sector in the USA and California. They are all the players are really shocked by this uh, sudden uh, pass away and I want to contribute mentioning him here. Well, pressure on the market brings productions, stops and insolvencies. We have seen uh, KBB collector bow shifting collector or selling collector production outside Europe, closing it down in Berlin, in Germany. Kingspan Sun Renewables, which was uh, having a vacuum tube uh, production unit in Ireland for at least 15 years, closed the collector factory and completely stopped all solar thermal market uh, activities. We have seen three insolvencies last year, Aventa Solar from Norway, Fresnex Austria, Solar Rus from Netherlands. They were all caused by their inability to secure enough uh, business funding to increase their volumes. Um, the good news is Aventa Solar and Fresnex has both uh, found follow-up solutions. Aventa was uh, uh, purchased, the assets were purchased by a Norwegian fund, a Norsk SA, and they are now um, announcing to build a new uh, polymer collector production unit even in Norway, so this could be become a success story. And Fresnex, it's a linear Fresnel developer and a technology uh, provider. His technology was taken over by a partner, Ecoterm, so it's also not away from the market. Solarus is PVT and they will, that's not clear yet their future. But we have also seen some shock waves um, in solar thermal sector this year, um, which was uh, mainly the decision on closing Arcon Sunmark as, a, as their project development and collector produ production unit in April 2020. Um, it's the market leader in solar district heating, as we have heard from Werner Weiss several times. The decision is not related to Corona. It was taken already at the beginning of the year. It was caused by financial losses, uh, which were really intolerable because, uh, you know, project business is uh, really eating up margins and uh, the cost uh, are um, the, to gain are very low. And in Denmark, it was a high fluctuation of uh, projects. So some years were really big and then there was like half a year of almost nothing uh, put online and uh, this also called trouble. So the, the 
um, owners of Arkon Sunmark decided to close the whole company. It was uh, purchased by Green One Tech as the part of the European business and it was uh, purchased by Sunrain, what the Asian activity is concerned. So there is a good chance that, I mean, uh, project and knowledge and, and the production of the large scale collectors will continue. Sorry, the, the next um, big shake, uh, shock wave came when Glasspoint announced um, its insolvency in May 2020. This was due to a halt of additional funding by the investors. This was really a, a Corona decision. And um, I think it's a bad news for us because Glasspoint was a shining, um, you know, outstanding company, 350 people only concentrating on solar heat, uh, commercial ship uh, solar industrial heat uh, applications, and they had big plans. But they, um, well, their, their funding structure was in the sense that the investors were the same like their clients, all from the oil industry. So. That seems to be caused problems now in the Corona time when the oil price was down and the whole consumption was down. So the Mira ended not with one gigawatt as planned, but with 360, as Werner said. And the Bellbridge project in California was planned as a solar heat delivery contract with 850 megawatt. And this probably caused also part of the thrust because um, it was not able to finance this project. It should have started last we year, but it didn't start because you know they had to pre-finance it 100% pre as class point, becoming a heat delivery a contract. Uh, provider and this didn't succeed. So um, really sad news um, altogether. But good news to be a bit mixed here, uh, I see in the dynamic of ESCO business 2019, we have seen two SHIP, SHIP stands for Solar Heat for Industrial Processes and ESCO stands for Euro, um, energy service company. So you sell heat instead of equipment. So we have two new ship systems with ESCO models realized, one in France and one in Belgium. We have a big one under construction in France, 10 megawatt in a multi, uh, Multeries is the client, Kyotherm is the investor, and they actually told us that they have 11 more such ESCO projects under discussion with different clients outside France together with uh, solar thermal system providers. We have the first contracts under negotiation by Sunti France and Millennium Energy Jordan. We have seen really an increasing number of companies looking into this ESCO business in recent years and now with continuous like success, which is the good news. The new paradigma, I have mentioned this company already before, founded a new subsidiary for only for ESCO renewable heat ESCO projects. And they ended up with two, the two first projects uh, in heat pumps, but they, I think they aim also at solar heat at the long run. And uh, the Austrian uh, company, a startup, I think three years or two years ago, completed one new ESCO project, a smaller one in a, in a sports club or something. We have looked into SHIP uh, more uh, carefully because uh, we, we consider this uh, a, a high potential market. To give the floor to the suppliers, we have created this website to show that there is a strong and committed supply chain. We, you find uh, companies, all the markers are technology providers. If you open them, you find their number of references and the number of collector areas they realized in SHIP and um, if they have a collector type and if they offer also the ESCO single. We have 76 companies listed currently, um, of which 61 are collector producers, 30% uh, are, well, technology neutral. And you see that they offer all different kinds of collectors and also concentrating ones become more dominant in this field. Well, chip is a highly fluctuating market. This is what we found out with our annual surveys. You see here that we have uh, started with 107 chip systems be put up in 2017, and this is now down to 86 chip systems. This is, but this is sort of partly because of high fluctuations in the dominating markets. I think overall the ship market is fairly stable. 
and it was mainly uh, Mexico that performed very differently in 2019 to 2018 because we had in Mexico 51 projects in 2018 and only 26 in 2019 and we had a de decline over the, the three years in India which was significant from 22 systems in 2017 to now seven systems in 2019. So um, I think it's a it's a tough market but it's a it's a sustaining market it, but we hear from the technology suppliers always that it's very difficult to bring deals to the to the contracting phase, you know, and really build them. And uh, I think that um, they at the last survey called very clearly for a frank, uh, you know, like supporting measures, either a quote or a carbon tax, which makes their systems uh, more relevant to the industry. Uh, clients because they usually have a lot of priorities but not so much to have a new solar system. This is a, a ranking of the most experienced chip suppliers with the number of systems they realized. You see that the industry hub is really Mexico, India, Germany and China and uh, you find these concentrating collector manufacturers among the established companies uh, which shows that this collector technology is really getting into the scene. It's small number still. This is maybe for your records for later on. This gives you the overview of all concentrating collector volumes which were installed. Mira from a glass point makes a big difference. In 2019, they put up uh, 257,000 systems. Normally, the world market is around 36,000 systems. So you see that this is very small number still, but um, with a high potential. To close my presentation, I would like to tell you, tell pictures, to use pictures to tell your story and use our photo database that we put up. There are already more than 100 photos included. Uh, looking at uh, ship projects from around the world, all copyright free, so you can download them in high resolution, use them for your publications and just mention the copyright donor. Thank you very much for the attention and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, uh, Berbel. So you were telling us that the Google Status report from uh, Rent NT1, one of the main uh, reports uh, covering renewables worldwide, gives a strong message promoting the need to pay more attention to heating and cooling, that uh, uh, and cooling is not properly covered in policies worldwide, uh, and barriers uh, today uh, are similar to those found uh, 10 years ago. Uh, you also reported on some relevant examples of new projects and trends in terms of uh, uh, the development in different markets and an overview of uh, the status of the business with production numbers for uh, the main manufacturers of flat plate collectors, as well as the evolution in terms of business uh, with some relevant players leaving the market, but also telling us good news on new projects, namely uh, on the scope of uh, uh, ESCO uh, business. Um, so overall, very interesting, and uh, uh, we already have some some questions as happened for uh, the presentation of Werner uh, uh, coming out that we'll be able to address uh, later on. So going to our uh, uh, last speaker, um, I'm also very happy to introduce to you uh, Vasiliki Dursu. So um, you might know Vasiliki. Uh, in different uh, uh, roles. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you uh, uh, already know her, but in different roles. Uh, so while she is the head of the uh, solar thermal department of the Greek uh, Research Center for Renewable Energy Sources, uh, she has also been for many years the technical secretary of the CENTC 312, so the Technical Committee uh, for Standardization of uh, Thermal Solar Systems and Components in Europe. And more recently, Vasiliki became also the manager of Solar Key Market Network, besides many other activities, uh, some of them related to IA SHC uh, tasks. And last but not least, uh, being a board member of the Greek Solar Thermal Industry Association. So Vasiliki has a deep understanding of the solar thermal sector, uh, and in particular, as, 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 as it comes naturally, of the Greek markets, and she will share some of this knowledge with their presentation on thermosiphon solar systems in Greece and analysis of a success story. Vasiliki, uh, please, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Pedro, for the introduction. I would like to welcome everyone participating in the webinar. 
I'm quite happy seeing such high interest for the topic and I'm very proud being part of this endeavor today. I wish to thank also the International Solar Energy Society for the organization of this webinar. And uh, before starting my presentation, let me also express my great appreciation to Werner Weiss for this invitation and the excellent opportunity that gave me to speak about the success of solar thermal technology in my country, Greece. The topic I intend to discuss is focused on the most important parameters that contributed to the successful establishment of solar thermal market in Greece. So let's begin by refreshing your memory about Greece. Greece is a country located in Southeast Europe. Its official name is Hellenic Republic, and it is also known as Elas. In Greek language, it is spelled Elada. Its population is approximately 10.7 million. And Athens, it's a nation's capital. It is the largest city in Greece, followed by Thessaloniki. Uh, Greece is considered the cradle of Western civilization, being the birthplace of democracy, Western philosophy and uh, literature, historiography, political science, major scientific and mathematical principles, Western drama, and of course, the uh, famous Olympic Games. It is uh, situated on the southern tip of the Balkan Peninsula, and it is located at the crossroads of Europe, Asia, and Africa, as you can see. And what about solar energy? Uh, Greek territory is an area with an affluent and reliable supply of solar energy, even during the winter period. Uh, the entire country's territory is characterized by high solar radiance, so the annual solar energy at horizontal plane varies between 1,450 and 1,800 kilowatt hours per square meter. Uh, that's the general picture for Greece. Uh, so now I'd like to move on to solar thermal key figures overview. Uh, we have already seen in Werner Weiss' presentation that Greece is among the leading countries worldwide, both in cumulated solar thermal collector capacity in operation and in highest market penetration per capita. The Greek solar thermal market mostly consists of individual thermosiphon type solar water heaters. By the end of 2019, a total capacity of 3,407 megawatt thermal was installed in the country, corresponding to the amount of 4,867,500 square meters of solar collectors, producing more than 3,300 gigawatt hours annually energy. By the end of 2019, 361 and 500 square meters of solar collectors was installed in Greece. This means an increase in new collector installations by 10% compared to the previous year, to the year 2018. The Greek solar thermal market mostly consists of individual thermosiphon type solar water heaters. A typical system is composed of 150 to 300 liters of hot water storage with two up to four square meter of highly selective flat plate collector with usually in most of cases at the freeze protection. Favorable climate resulting that the system covers 80 to 90 percent of the yearly sanitary hot water needs of a single family. The user is well aware of solar contribution as he or she is actively turned on the backup electric heater very few times per year. Fundamentally, the majority of solar thermal systems in the country are produced by Greek manufacturers. In other words, Greek solar thermal industries cover more than 95% of the domestic market. Likewise, a considerable part of the Greek production is exported. In this chart, you can see the development over the past 10 years of the domestic and exporting market. It is evident that more than 50% of the country's production is exported. More importantly, the diagram indicates that over the very last years, this percentage is significantly higher. So that was a general picture for the domestic and exporting market. Now let's look at the importing markets of solar thermal products. Uh, this map has been produced using the trade map tool that was developed by the International Trade Center. 
trade map covers more than 200 countries and territories and more than 5,000 products of the harmonized system. The code that uh, is used is uh, 84-1919, that is for instantaneous or storage water heaters, non-electric, excluding instantaneous gas water heaters and boilers or water heaters for central heating. We could say with safety that under this code is exported the majority of uh, solar thermal products from Greece. Now we see that Italy, United Arab Emirates, France, Morocco, Albania, Portugal, Cyprus, Chile, Egypt hold the great share of Greece of Greece exports over the two estit, over the 20 listed countries. That completes my overview of Greek export and activity in solar thermal products. So now I'd like to turn to thermosiphon system characteristics as a product. To the average consumer, a thermosiphon system is a highly efficient product, which is easy to install, represent good value for money, and provide the dependency from other users. Its procurement price corresponds to an average monthly salary, making it affordable and can be installed within a day. Uh, systems are usually replaced after 20 or 25 years, whilst annual maintenance costs are negligible. Solar systems are considered safer than typical electric heaters. And as I have been saying, the Greek solar thermal market mostly consists of individual thermosiphon type solar water heaters. Regarding the main characteristics of the current solar thermal market, we could say that uh, it is a mature one as Greek solar thermal industry made its first steps mid of 1970s and expanded rapidly in the 1980s. Currently, there is an extensive net of suppliers and installers over the whole mainland and on the islands. Besides, it is driven by competition between the manufacturers. Now that uh, we are aware of the situation, let's begin with the presentation of the parameters that led to the well-established market in Greece. I want to start with the reference of some historical factors that contributed to this development. Historical factors that contributed to this development were the successful installation of a large number of solar thermal systems early in the 1980s, the shock of rising energy prices due to the oil crisis, a series of effective promotional campaigns along with tax and low interest financing and the existence of the first domestic producers. The first domestic producers coped with this demand as Greek solar thermal industry made its first steps mid of 1970s and expanded rapidly in the 1980s. In order to promote solar hot water systems, Greek government offered a number of significant incentives by means of targeted laws that supported the solar thermal sector. A fundamental point is also the fact that the Greek manufacturers adopted quite early standardization procedures improving their product's quality. The European Technical Committee sent Technical Committee 312 for the solar thermal systems and components was established and supported by Greek pioneers. And even to this day, the Secretariat and Chairmanship are held by Greek experts and supported by the Greek Solar Thermal Industry Association. In addition, more than 100 Greek products are certified by the main European quality label for solar thermal products, that is Solar Keymark. Currently, this figure represents approximately the 10% of the total valid licenses in the scheme database. Next point of my presentation refers to the building typology in the country. Greece has a high home ownership rate in excess of 75%. The typical Greek consumer happily invests in his, her own residence and prefers a high degree of autonomy, not be keen on sharing the use of infrastructure with his or her neighbors. Hence, autonomous heating and hot water production systems are strongly favored both in new and in refurbished buildings. Most of roofs are flat in the buildings, making easier the installation of a solar system. 
Apart from the historical reasons referred, some additional parameters led to the rising trend of the Greek market over the last years. Firstly, the governmental support by means of favorable legislation. The installation of a solar thermal system to cover at least 60% of hot water now is mandatory for every new building according to the Energy Efficiency Building Regulation Code. Moreover, the installation of a solar thermal system for hot water production is funded by up to 70% by the Saving Energy at Home 1 and 2 programs. Besides, the roof installation of a residential photovoltaic system is allowed only upon the prerequisite that the solar thermal system is installed for hot water production. Secondly, the competition among Greek companies and a correct appraisal of the economic recession and the market situation between 2010 and 2018 uh, led to lower retail prices for thermosiphon systems. In addition, energy prices surge. Taxation of heating oil led to an increase of its price by more than 120%. Electricity prices rose due to high indirect fixed costs like the municipal and renewable fees and carbon taxation. Only natural gas remained comparatively affordable, but the gas grid covers less than 50% of the Greek households. Hence, solar hot water production remained an attractive and, of course, affordable option. Thirdly, I would like to summarize some more parameters that contribute to this upward tendency of the market, like the expansion of e-commerce and of distribution network that includes large electric and home appliances chains. These factors on one, hand, on one hand make it even easier to buy a solar system and on the other hand increased in competition between the manufacturers. Last but not least, environmental concerns in significant part of Greek society, especially the more dynamic part of the population between 30 and 50 years of age, which are the main consumers in the building sector, drive for more environmental friendly and renewable energy source based uh, products. Finally, I'd like to leave you with this slide. Lately, a lot of discussions are on the table and a series of measures are considered for the support of electric cars. Considering the average emissions of a new car that is about 120 grams per kilometer and an average distance of uh, 12,000 kilometers per year, it is calculated an amount of 1,400 kilograms annually avoided CO2 emissions by an electric car. Or in better wording, if, if an electric car could save all the emissions of a typical car, which of course is not the case, then would save the amount of 1,400 kilograms CO2 per year. Counterpart calculations for a typical solar thermal system with collector area of two and a half square meters and storage about 150 liters that replaces an electric heater, concluding the amount of 1,700 kilograms annually of avoided CO2 emissions. In this sense, it reveals the potential and the value of solar thermal, but also the need policy measures to treat fair solar thermal. And now, before giving the floor again to Pedro, I want to say that this presentation is based on, is based on a joint effort with estimated collaborator, Mr. Kostas Travasaros from Prime Laser Company and Professor Agis Papadopoulos from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And uh, it is uh, submitted as a research paper to Eurosan 2020 conference to be held in September virtually. Furthermore, I wish to express my gratitude to Greek Solar Thermal Industry Association for providing support and information, and particularly to the company Sole, Calpac, Papa Emanuel, Cosmosolar, Melpo, Maltesos for the kind offer of the photos that I used in my presentation. I hope that you find the information provided interesting and useful. And I'll be happy to take any questions, comments or feedback either immediately after during the discussion section that follows either afterwards directly in my email as given here. Thank you for your attention, your presence in the webinar and your support to solar thermal technology. 
Uh, Pedro, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vasiliki. So you, uh, besides uh, provoking us, making us think of uh, the beautiful scenarios in Greece and our holidays and making us wish we could go there uh, right away, you you also presented us uh, an overview of the, the the Greek solutions and in particular the relevance of the thermosiphon systems, which are uh, well-known systems, very competitive uh, and trusted systems. So that's also uh, an interesting and relevant point. You gave us an overview of the relevance of the solar thermal industry in Greece and its success, success in terms of uh, uh, exports. Um, and uh, overall, um, an insight of uh, uh, what does it mean, uh, the, the industry uh, in the context of, of the Greek market. So very interesting. Um, also the evolution over the years, uh, and to see that is already a, a, a traditional, and when we think of the renewable uh, sector, indeed uh, a, a quite long uh, success story also. So we are going now into the Q&A uh, sec uh, section. Um, we have uh, received uh, a considerable number of questions. Um, we will not be able to address uh, all of those. Uh, I would start with the, uh, some questions related to the, the presentation on the Solar Heat Worldwide uh, report. Uh, we will also try to cover uh, PVT. There were many related questions, uh, large systems, um, um, and uh, let's see also uh, if there are some more recent questions that we can we can cover. So I would start uh, uh, by asking Werner to um, to comment on a on a question from Faisal Ghani um, regarding an insight into the market development for solar thermal systems in sub-Sahara Africa. Um, so uh, focusing a bit more in this specific region. Werner, can we give us uh, can you give us an, an additional insight into this subregion? Yeah, briefly. Um, especially, I can give you an, an overview on the southern African region and West Africa. So, the in general, in our uh, publication in Solar Heat Worldwide Report, we always try to get more countries in and more data. So. What we show now is really a selected number of countries who have contacts now and where we get reliable data. So uh, what con what uh, relates to Southern Africa, the whole market there is quite fragile. I would say there is a, a lot of interest from policy in general, uh, might be even higher than in Europe, the interest in thermal energy because they have a lack of electricity in the southern in sub-Sahara Africa the main problem is lack of electricity and with, and they have a lot of social housing programs with every new house which is equipped with an electric hot water uh, geyser or tank they increase the demand for electricity um, at the same time of course this could be done cheaper and better with solar thermal systems, especially with thermal siphon systems. What is usually lacking in these countries is even if they have ambitious programs like in South Africa with the one million solar water heater program, but also in other countries, they simply don't have the capacity. So uh, good installers who can jump in and cope with this uh, one million solar water heater program, for instance. So if, if there's not a good policy behind it. So that means starting first with capacity building, train installers, and then build up step by step a, a large rollout program. This was in several countries really a problem. But on the other hand, I'm quite optimistic, especially also because we are working for 10 years now in the so-called salt train project in Southern Africa, where we see quite a good development even with all the problems uh, which occur. Um, and as Vasiliki mentioned before, also for European companies, they export a lot of uh, systems to Southern Africa, and then a strong competition there with the Chinese products. And unfortunately, there is nearly no uh, national, local or region, regional 
relevant production in Africa, where I think there's a lot of opportunities also for the regional, at least, production. I hope this uh, gives a short insight of sub sub Saharan Africa. Um, in, in West Africa, it's really a hard market. There's a very, very low market uh, just starting, and there are other hotspots in a positive way in Kenya and East Africa. Okay, thank you very much, Werner. Um, next question, I will try to combine uh, two questions. Um, which is what factors might cause the market to return to growth and uh, which uh, key macroeconomic factors um, could lead to uh, uh, growth in a, in a particular region regarding policy, cost of energy, etc. cetera. Um, shall I answer or? Yes, yes, please. But of course, uh, Berbel and Vasiliki, you are also free to, to comment, obviously. Uh, I think you have to distinguish between small and large scale systems. There are different uh, economic or macroeconomic backgrounds behind it. But we are struggling in Europe with uh, small scale systems or single family type systems for hot water preparation, especially where we have pump systems. I think the main obstacle there is that the cost of the system did not go down for the end consumer did not go down for the last 10 years. Even if the manufacturers tried a lot, they brought down the cost of their products. But for the end user, um, the, the price did not really go down compared to PV. Therefore, we are under really strong competition with PV systems and heat pump systems. Whether we like it or we don't like it, I think if we can not manage to reduce the cost for the end consumer, for the small scale systems, pump systems, um, I think it's really hard to come back to, to growth. On the other hand, I think what is missing worldwide is, uh, Bebel mentioned it in, in her presentation, is the awareness concerning heat. Policy usually is not aware that 50% of the final energy demand is heating and cooling just 20% is electricity, 30% is transport, because 90% of the policy, renewable energy policy is just on electricity. So we have really to increase the awareness of policy that 50%, half of the final energy demand is heat, and we have a lot to contribute. But nevertheless, as I mentioned before, we need to do our homework to reduce the cost for this small scale system. Large scale system, is a different approach. I think we need really specialized companies who have uh, they, who do not just want to sell collectors. They have to have a system approach for district solar district heating and for industrial process heat. You need to have a one-stop shop where you can go to a system provider and they install the system and have an understanding of the industrial process or on the other hand, on, on district heating, what are the requirements there? Um, I leave it here. And uh, I think uh, Bärbel is focusing usually more on policy. She can for sure contribute here. Yeah, but take it very slow, slow, low, because um, you know we need other questions as also to answer. I think that solar obligations got really stuck somewhere. You know, building codes. This was a very promising political instrument, and we see like Greece and Israel and India uh, markets uh, and Spain that react uh, positively to that. And um, we didn't succeed to spread this political instrument, you know, beyond the 23 or 25 countries that we have worldwide. So that's an, one issue that I see. But let's go to other questions, probably. <laughs> okay, so I would go into um, PVT. So we had the different questions of PVT. I would uh, uh, focus on a, on a more technical question on statistical aspects. Um, from Stefan Avres, so is the peak power capacity of PVT calculated the same way as for pure solar thermal collectors, or what is the lump sum calculation per square meter? I don't know if this is too technical, uh, but I, mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting challenge for you. It, it, it's an, an important question, and it's something uh, where we at the moment just rely 
on information we get from the different producers. The problem is that it's not so easy to, on a general level, to calculate uh, the maximum power in terms of thermal or, or electric, uh, like we have it with flat blade or evacuated tube collectors, because it depends heavily on uh, if you have a two square meter uh, panel, uh, what what is the percentage of uh, the area covered with PV it can be very different on different uh, PVT collectors of the design of the collector. So we have no uniform calculation method up to now. So what is needed here is for sure uh, tests uh, and uh, done by by certified test ins institutes. At the moment, we are purely relying on the uh, data we get from the manufacturers. And we have no possibility at the moment to check whether they are right on, or not. We have the same problem uh, with uh, concentrating systems. So parabolic troughs, you cannot compare one to each other, uh, to another or Fresnel collectors. This is a very important topic, which has to be taken up by um, test centers in the next years, because if you just compare all large scale systems we presented, uh, the total installed capacity or square meters, it's about something like more than 2 million square meters, 2.3 million square meters. And PVT is 1.1 million square meters. So there's a significant amount of systems there. But uh, as I said, uh, this is really missing how we calculate the power. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we will uh, come back to, to PVT maybe if we have the chance, uh, but I also wanted to cover within our time uh, other other aspects. So, um, question to Berbel from Maria João Carvalho. Um, although the number of ship systems decrease, the power installed is higher. Can these uh, be considered a positive signal? You mean the megawatt installed? Uh, I've net, I didn't mention that because of time reasons. This is um, the Mira project, which is causing these high fluctuations because Mira came um, in power or put up in operation in blocks. So we had like 2017, 100 megawatt, and then we had 2018, no, not a single megawatt. And then we had again, like uh, 160 megawatt or something. So this was in blocks and this makes the high fluctuation there is not really a clear, too clear trend to larger systems because the Mexicans are very dominating the ship market and they have small systems. And uh, China has relatively large ship systems, but a small number. So I cannot see at the moment really a trend to larger systems. In Europe, yes, the few systems that were installed, they are mainly driven by France, you know, by the nice subsidy in France and, and the Netherlands, like Werner Weiss mentioned, uh, the agriculture cultural installations, which we now count as ship recently. So they add to the statistics as well, but the world market itself only reacts uh, smallly to that. Very well, thank you very much, Verbal. Um, we will go now um, to the, some, some questions related to, to Greece. So Vasiliki, I will try to, to combine them. Um, so one of the, the aspects is regarding the domestic uh, production and uh, how could it be so successfully uh, established uh, in Greece? Um, how can it resist the, comp the, the competition from uh, uh, other uh, uh, markets? Um, we can think of China, we can also think of, uh, for instance, uh, uh, close by Turkey. Um, and um, why did, uh, so how is it possible that the success story uh, subsided so continued uh, even um, uh, the country having faced uh, an important uh, uh, financial crisis effects of the financial crisis from uh, uh, 2008 compared to other countries Okay, thank you, Pedro. A lot of questions. Um, yes, uh, regarding the first part, if I will remember about the domestic uh, sector, I was trying to analyze the 
the parameters that uh, supported this situation today in, in the presentation. So I already mentioned some historical reasons and some reasons that uh, are currently ongoing. So I, I don't think that, uh, okay, it, it is uh, useful now to, to repeat uh, the whole story. Uh, in any case, my presentation will be available, but uh, I want to comment on the second part of the question that uh, stated about the situation after the economic uh, crisis. It is true that um, in the years of economic crisis, um, 12, 13 years ago, there was a, a, there was a let's say a recession also in the installation of solar thermal systems but after only a period a small period of uh, two or three years then it was a turn let's say of uh, of the people in uh, renewable energy sources so uh, i mentioned in my presentation that the cost of a solar thermal system it is about a monthly salary of an average uh, uh, salary in greece so it is something that's quite cheap to be uh, to be paid, uh, so it is very easy. It is uh, it's not costly to to have a renewable energy system. So from one hand, from one hand, uh, people they're waiting somehow to to have uh, lower prices after the economic crisis. But uh, when this period uh, passed, then it is true that more people. Uh, invested on a solar thermal system because I mentioned already that the prices of electricity and the cost of energy were high. So it was a win-win situation. Um, the third part of the question regarding the competition from Turkey and Israel. Okay, this is a, a multi-parameter, let's say, uh, let's say, reply in this in this question as i mentioned before there was a, a critical a critical um, domestic uh, industrial activity from uh, early uh, 80s uh, so this means that the uh, the greek uh, product gained the trust of uh, greek uh, people so there is also um, the neighborhood syndrome in our country uh, the consumer preferred to, to use the same system as a neighbor, neighbor has instead of buying something else. And all, of course, in this direction, uh, concur also the quality of uh, Greek uh, systems, the price, as I mentioned before, and already the existing situation. I think I have covered the, the question. If there is something else, please uh, tell me, Pedro, there was another part of the question. I think you covered the, the the main thing. It was quite uh, broad, and we uh, we still we also have some other interesting questions to cover. So mm -hmm. I would uh, still try to to address um, uh, those. Um, we have uh, um, let's say um, a, a, a longer one, but I will try to to cover the the full question um, and. Uh, I would ask Berbel, but of course, again, Verden uh, Vasiliki, uh, if you also want to comment. Uh, so the value of it as service delivered by decentralized heating renewables, the solar thermal, should be equal to the avoided costs of the service of the service replaced in a process to try to maximize electrification by renewables uh, via legislation and financial support. How can we avoid to substitute high efficient European-made renewable products by higher cost electric renewables, including batteries and network. Would it be justified to offer priority on the roof for the best solution? So this is a question from Costa Servasaros. Ooh, <laughs> this was a complicated one. I should answer that one. Um, I think I didn't really get the story, the, the, question. Werner, did you understand the complete question? The beginning was regarding large scale and then it was a competition between PV solutions with battery against solar water heaters. I, I think in also uh, in the presentation you, you were referring from GSR that there is still uh, a lot of support for um, fossil fuels. Uh, fossil fuels? Oh. No, 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 no. I, I'm trying to make the parallel. So there is discussion about uh, that there is to have a lot of support for fossil fuels, 
But what you we see also in terms of policy, uh, in particular in Europe, and I think this is a very European question, I don't know how it applies to other regions, is that there is also a strong push for specific solutions trying to promote electrification of the heat sector. So, um, in, in this context, uh, is uh, how can we promote a level playing field, uh, knowing that, for instance, there is also competition for the supply of energy locally, including um, on roofs. If if I take the question, I think this is the what is what is trying to address. So wow. should we should we should we uh, find the let's say the 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 golden uh, solution, the the silver bullet to promote solar thermal uh, more solar thermal versus uh, solutions that are trying to to from uh, to deal with the heat from the electrification side? Well, uh, to make it very short, because we are almost over time, I would recommend everybody to think of solutions that are, uh, you know, logically integrating heat pumps and solar heat. Because the, the solar, the heat pump uh, is so strong everywhere. We see it in India, in industry. We see it in China, in industry. We see it in uh, France, in, in residential, in Germany, in residential. So it's so strong and it seems, you know, it's so pushed by this electrification idea that the only way to go against it is to say that heat pump and solar thermal are a great combination. And in many in many large systems, it's the case, you know, because technical temperature levels can be adapted by heat pumps. They have their limitations and solar thermal. So my recommendation would be always to uh, find uh, technically suitable combinations. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, may I just ask Vernon Vasiliki if I have a final comment uh, in this question or some other of the previous questions? Werner? I assume not. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I ah, sorry, could, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Werner. Concerning the electrification of the heat sector, well, we discussed it several times on European level. I think there is simply, uh, if we want to reach our goals concerning environment, we have to focus on heat as well. It will not work. Just to give you a short example on Germany, if they want to replace the coal power plants, the uh, nuclear power plants by PV and wind, this is a huge challenge. It has to do it in a few years. And if you also want to electrify the heat sector at the same time, I don't believe it's working in good time. So it's just really a lack of policy, of the awareness of policy here that we don't reach our goals if we just talk about electrification of the heat sector but they have an excellent story. And this excellent story for policy, in short, is missing in the, for, this, for the whole thermal sector. You have to get better here and you have to reduce the prices, as I mentioned before already. Otherwise, um, you have a weak argument. Thank you very much. Vasiliki? Uh, something very small, uh, but I want to add to what Vernon already mentioned about the digitalization. Uh, I just want to mention that digitalization can have a major contribution to further increase of the number of installed systems. And uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, policy measures have to treat fair solar thermal. The value of heat as service delivered by solar system should be equal to the avoided cost of the servers to place of alternatives. Only this. Thank you very much, Pedro. Very good. So I think uh, uh, the def the question was difficult and is is obviously a, a, a one that is uh, will re uh, will still uh, be further uh, uh, reflected upon. But I think uh, both of you covered the three three important aspects at least from from the how to address this: the combination with different technologies, finding the a simple and and, and strong story for solar thermal. Uh, and also look into new solutions like digitalization. So I think uh, we cover very well uh, a difficult one. So I, with this, um, I would like to to thank the speakers for the the very good presentations, as also the 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 questions, uh, the the answers to to these different questions. Uh, I also want to uh, uh, thank everyone that was attending this webinar. Uh, 
Um, and uh, uh, from my side, I also want to thank the, the IA Solar Academy and the particular IA uh, Solid Cooling Program and ISIS for the invitation and for the work they've been doing uh, with uh, uh, the different webinars. So not only these, and I invite you also to see the different webinars organized. And um, as Barbara mentioned uh, before closing and passing the, the, the word to, to Arabella, uh, I would also like to express uh, 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 the fact the big loss that Les Nelson represented to the, to the solar thermal industry. Uh, it will be uh, deeply missed by, by all of us, uh, but it will remain certainly in our, in our memories. So that's it from, from our side. Um, and uh, uh, depending where you are, I wish you a, a continuation of good morning, afternoon or evening. And now I, I pass back the baton to, to Arabella for a, a final message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro, and thank you very much to all of our speakers and you, the audience, for this great webinar. I think we had loads and loads of questions and we tried to get through as many as possible, and there are still many more left. So now, before we end this webinar today, um, I is very happy to sh um, share two more webinar invitations with you as well as one important event update, and we are very happy to invite you to join us for all of these upcoming events. The first one is going to be Eurosan 2020. Um, Basilica already mentioned it. It's going to be um, a virtual conference this year for the very first time. Eurosan 2020 is the 13th international conference on solar energy for buildings and industry. And registration for this event is going to open over the next few days. Um, so I'd encourage all of you to um, have a look on our homepage, which is eurosan.org, eurosan2020.org, sorry. Um, to see what this conference is all about and then to register if you are interested. ISIS members, please remember you have a discount code coming your way to attend this um, event. And then one webinar invitation um, is that we are going to be very happy on July the 6th to welcome REN21 for an entire webinar dedicated specifically to the Renewables 2020 Global Status Report. And just as we did today, but even more, we will dive deep into the full report and cover numbers, facts, and trends of renewables worldwide. So you can join us for this on July the 6th, and the registration for this is open on the ISIS homepage. And then also, already next week on June the 30th, which is next Tuesday, ISIS is also happy to present and take part in the next webinar of the REN Alliance, which is a partnership of different organizations representing renewable energy. And this webinar will explore how renewables can work together in the wake of the global COVID pandemic. Registration for this event is also open on the ISIS homepage. Now for my final announcement. There will be, of course, a recording of today's webinar and it will be available on both the ISIS as well as the IAA HSC homepages in a few days. For our ISIS members, please remember you already have the unlimited access to all past webinar recordings as well as the presentations through your personal ISIS members area. And then on behalf of ISIS, we thank all of you and of course our great set of speakers once again for your participation in today's webinar. We are always looking forward for your feedback and you can write to us at public.relations at ISIS.org and of course we invite you to complete the survey which you will receive as a follow-up. Also, remember that there is this 20% discount I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, so we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you again, everybody who joined us today. I am now going to end the webinar, and we wish you a great day wherever you are around the world. Goodbye.